I think we might get started and I will welcome everybody here today. My name is Fern Haynes. I'm from the Arthur Island Institute as well, welcoming you to number four of our ARI Legacy Seminars, celebrating 50 years of science at ARI, which is just wonderful. And we've had three terrific seminars already and we've got number four today. Before we start, I want to acknowledge um, the various lands of traditional owners across the places which we're meeting today. I'm on Tongaron country. I pay my respects to elders and traditional owners past, present and emerging across the country today. So I uh, would like to thank Peter for coming to deliver this talk for us today to talk with us about the beginnings of wildlife research at ARI the first 25 years. We're going to hear uh, after this, the next seminar will be from Lindy Lumsden talking about the next phase, but Peter's going to give us this birth of ecological research and I guess um, ecological consciousness at ARI. As, um, as I noted, this is number four. The first three legacy seminars are already up on our website. You can jump on there and have a look at any point. I'm now going to hand over to Peter. Peter, thank you so much. Over to you. Thanks, Fern. Yes, Chupara jackets at Wilson's Prom in the pouring rain. If I remember rightly, they weren't all that effective. Anyway, um, today I hope to present a brief review of the history and significance of wildlife research conducted at ARI in its first 25 years that is up until about 1995. Uh, as Fern mentioned, Lindy Lumsden will highlight some of the more recent research in the next seminar in this series. Inevitably, this will be a personal and idiosyncratic view, but I hope I can do justice to some of the very significant research that took place during those first few decades. Uh, the major socio-political factors that influenced the direction of that research and how the research focus changed rapidly through those early decades. And of course, I'll highlight some of the important outcomes and examples of how ARI research has had lasting benefit. I'll begin with a quick summary of the social and political milieu which prevailed at the time when ARI was being planned, uh, the, that is the 1960s. So a little bit of history. Victoria has had a Game Act since 1890 and a Fisheries and Game Department for nearly as long. The original intent was primarily to provide a mechanism to protect introduced game, but it also allowed for the declaration of closed seasons for native species. But only the platypus was protected at first. And there was no substantive change to that legislation over the next 85 years apart from the seemingly ad hoc addition of native animals, mostly mammals and game birds, to the schedules and proclaiming of closed seasons for some of those. And it wasn't until 1973, when bats and native rodents were finally added to the schedules, that all terrestrial vertebrates received legislative protection, except for the wombat and snakes. So thinking about that, for the first 20 years of my life, the smoky mouse and the grey-headed flying fox, for example, had no legal protection. In 1958, the Fisheries and Game Department was rebadged the Fisheries and Wildlife Branch of the Attorney General's Department. And that was a positive change, recognising growing public interest in conservation and management of native wildlife. And it was around then, perhaps a bit later, when the Fisheries and Wildlife logo featuring the platypus was adopted. Um, so at least it featured a native animal and that logo of course was de was designed by Bob Warnicke, one of the original wildlife researchers in the department. So at this time wildlife was really considered to be a resource to be used, which I think denies the intrinsic value of flora and fauna and results in an emphasis on consumptive use and pests. Hunting was particularly popular 
and providing for and regulating the hunting of ducks, snipe, quail and deer was a major focus. But it was also an important source of revenue for the Fisheries and Wildlife Department through the selling of game licences. But we also should acknowledge that hunting organisations, notably the Victorian Field and Game Association, were leading conservationists in the 1950s and 60s. And they did this through land purchase, opposing the drainage of wetlands, including important wetlands today like Herd Swamp, and actively managing other wetlands such as the Lake Connawarri system down at Geelong, and advocating generally for habitat reservation, uh, at least of wetlands, in game reserves, which are open to hunting, or, or but also in sanctuaries, which are close, were close to hunting. And at this time, 1958, Henry Bolte had been Premier of a Liberal Party government since 1947, and he remained in power until 1972, an astonishing 25 years. Bolte was a Western District grazier and a keen hunter and fisher. And there's a photograph of him when he was Premier out in the wetlands shooting up near Kerrang. Um, <clears throat> I doubt that a modern Premier would uh, want, a public, want a photo like that published in the newspaper. So within the Fisheries and Wildlife Branch, around this time there was a fledgling wildlife research group forming and was actively investigating matters relating to game species and some potential pests. There was a lot of work on them trying to understand the movement of game ducks. And this was done through banding studies, mostly at Serendip Research Station at Lara, uh, conducted by Max Downs and then continued by Ian Norman. And Serendip was intended to be a display farm, advocating and educating for the provision of wildlife habitat on farms a precursor, if you like, to the Land for Wildlife scheme, which was also an ARI initiative in the early 1980s, but now sadly neglected by the department. Uh, research into Australian fur seals was initiated after pressure from the fishing industry, concerned about seals taking too many fish, and that continued for some 30 years, at, based at Seal Rocks, um, led by Bob Warnicke. The reintroduction of koalas to un unoccupied mainland habitat was a major focus, and that is the original and most successful wildlife reintroduction program in Victoria, probably Australia's history. And there was all, also research into native pest species, including perhaps surprisingly for some the bush rat, because of damage it did to seedling pine trees that the Forest Commission was trying to grow uh, in its big program of creating pine forests. And Matt White told us about the enormous areas of bushland that were cleared to make way for pine plantations during the 1950s and 60s. Also, perhaps surprisingly, the water rat was considered a pest because of damage it did by burrowing into the uh, banks of irrigation channels. And water rats were, there are open seasons on water rats too in the 1950s because their pelts were um, highly valued. So then there was a steady increasing focus given to research into native wildlife and all terrestrial vertebrates. Uh, Keith Dempster, Bob Warnicke, John Seabeck, and Norman Wakefield from Monash University were prominent in this increasing interest in, in the native wildlife. And there were investigations into macropods, potteroos, bandicoots, quolls, antichinus, and rodents. But there was still a large focus on game species and particularly on deer. And even in my working life, and one of my early field trips in 1977 was down to Corner Inlet to conduct wildlife surveys on some of the islands in the inlet. And uh, we were taken through the islands by the local fisheries and wildlife officer in his boat. And I was, uh, a fresh young graduate, I was rather astonished to find that the wildlife officers were trapping hog deer on uh, Snake Island and on some sites on the mainland and actively transporting them 
translocating them to other islands in Corner Inlet. So in my working lifetime, the Victorian government was actively promoting the spread of introduced deer species around the state. Pretty amazing, really. Now I want to digress slightly to talk about a, an important conservation issue in the late 1960s and early 1970s, because it had a big impact on government conservation policies and on ARI. Uh, sorry. And that is the Little Desert controversy. Um, this contentious and hard fought conservation battle was not over rainforest or Tasmanian wilderness. It was about a stretch of sandy, infertile country carrying mostly heath and Malaluka scrub, the little desert uh, in the West Wimmera. The Minister for Lands, Soldier Settlement and Conservation at the time, Sir William MacDonald, and note that title, the Government Department, Lands, Soldier Settlement and Conservation. There's, I think, potential for conflict there. Um, so Sir William MacDonald proposed to alienate the entire 133,000 hectares of crown land in the Little Desert to create further farmland, which was surely going to be marginal. And the groundswell of opposition to this proposal, led by the Victorian National Parks Association and a newly formed group, the Save Our Bushlands Action Committee, was nature conservation in its purest sense. Rather than the protection of scenic values or sites for adventure tourism, this was entirely about flora and fauna conservation. And I think it demonstrated a sophistication and nuanced understanding by sectors of the Victorian community to almost bring down the most powerful and established premier in Victorian history over flora and fauna conservation in this distant patch of scrub. <clears throat> so here's a, uh, a really interesting newspaper photograph from the time. It shows Sir William leading a convoy of Land Rovers, presumably containing VIPs. Uh, they seem to be going cross country through the desert. And Sir William even brought along his kangaroo dogs, uh, presumably in the hope that he might have been able to partake in a little bit of sport. Sorry, I'm being facetious. Um, but in its impact on public policy, the Little Desert Campaign is as important as the concurrent Lake Pedder controversy in Tasmania, because it led directly to a momentous change in government policy, encapsulated by the next Premier, who came in in 1972 or three, not quite sure which, Rupert Hamer, again a Liberal Party government, and he placed great issues on great importance on what he called quality of life issues. And he formed a standalone Ministry for Conservation into which the Fisheries and Wildlife Division and ARI slotted very neatly. And if you wish to learn more about this uh, little desert campaign, I recommend ecological historian Libby Robin's book on the subject and called Defending the Little Desert. And just note the subtitle there, The Rise of Ecological Consciousness in Australia. So she sees the real importance of this particular campaign and it happened right here in Victoria, right at the time that ARI was being planned and built. And importantly for today's story, it led to the formation of the Land Conservation Council of Victoria. And I'll return to the LCC shortly. But first, if I may digress a little bit uh, to give a personal view of the Little Desert campaign. Um, I spent my early childhood in Mill on the edge of the Little Desert and we used, my family used to go to the Little Desert for picnics and the Big Desert. So this is where my interest in natural history developed. Um, on the left there I've got a photo of my grandmother Enid Crouch out in the desert um, picking a posy of wildflowers. I mean, she really loved the floristic diversity in the orchids and wildflowers out there. The middle picture shows me, aged eight, uh, standing beside a photography hide that my father and I built beside a mallee mound. And my introduction to zoology, if you like, or natural history, included getting up way before dawn, being 
seated in the hide before first light, being told to sit still and be quiet and ignore the mosquitoes until the mallee fowl uh, came to work the mound at dawn and we obtained some pretty good photos for the time, I like to think. So that's my connection to the Little Desert. Um, and then thinking about that period of time, the late 60s and early 70s, I realised that it was really a quite a radical period for conservation, as well as for so many other areas of public interest and debate. Victorian conservation issues at the time centred around timber harvesting and the lack of a representative conservation reserve system, with the Al Alpine National Park as its emblematic focus. And also at that time, we started to get the publication of workable field guides to the Australian fauna. And in particular here, I highlight Peter Slater's Field Guide to Australian Birds, published in 1970, just when ARI opened, and Hal Cogger's uh, book on reptiles and amphibians that included identification keys. That So in this way, a much larger number of people could effectively identify our know, fauna. It wasn't just the realm of museum specialists. I'd also highlight Judith Frankenberg's Nature Conservation in Victoria, published in 1971. Um, that was pretty much a stock take of where we were in, in flora and fauna conservation at the time of ARI's establishment. And there were important books about the Alps at the Crossroads, uh, called, sorry, titled The Alps at the Crossroads, which was um, aiming to get a, a, an important Alpine National Park established, and that was eventually achieved through the Land Conservation Council process. But of course, there are still contentious management issues there, notably over the control of feral herbivores. And husband and wife team, the Routleys, published an important book that argued that clear fowl harvesting of native forests is not a wise use, especially when they're used for wood chips. And yet younger listeners may not realise that this fight over best use of native forests has been a 50 year campaign. And maybe in Victoria, we're now approaching the end game. So where did ARI fit in all of this? What was its role? So the director of ARI at, at the time in 1970 was Elf Dunbabin Butcher. And he wrote this, uh, what he saw as ARI's charter. It's to provide the basic data, the facts and the inventories, which will permit the interpretation and the assessment uh, which are required for the ethical use of resources. So I think he hit the nail on the head pretty well. Gathering at this stage, gathering basic data and inventories was a real, a really important uh, lack that we had. And he's highlighting that then the interpretation and assessment of those data, and then using those that information to better manage our resources. So that need for basic inventory was really uh, recognised by the Land Conservation Council, which was established by the Rupert Hamer government. And they set about undertaking a really big stock take of the natural resources and societal values existing on Crown land in each of their 16 study areas shown in the map. And the council itself comprised senior staff, usually at secretarial level, of government agencies having a land management role. And the LCC commissioned many studies and funded those. And the LCC staff then used those data to prepare summary, summary reports of Crown land values within each study area and then develop recommendations aimed at providing a balance of land use across the state. And those uh, recommendations were almost invariably accepted by subsequent governments. And one of those things that the LCC funded was the establishment of the Wildlife Survey Unit based at ARI under the leadership 
of a genial American, Bill Emerson. And that work continued for about 25 years. Some of the major outcomes of that can be seen in these maps. So on the left hand side, we have the conservation reserve system on public land in 1970. So the red areas and the yellow areas, if you can see them, they're tiny, um, were the conservation reserves at the time of ARI's establishment. And then uh, in 2005, on the right, more than 40% of public land had been reserved for conservation purposes through that LCC process. And you, know, you can see major new national parks in the Alpine country, the high country, East Gippsland, the Grampians, the Otways, and so on, and the Mallee. So that's a really tangible example of how the work of ARI helped to make a huge difference. Another way that this work was really important was in the development of wildlife spatial data. If I can take, if I can tell you another anecdote from my early days, my first job after graduating was at the Museum of Victoria, and I had a role there that many would consider as mind-numbingly boring, but to me it was a, a joy and a revelation. My role was to collate information for the Land Conservation Council on the species of wildlife that occurred in each of those 16 study areas that were recorded in the, in the data associated with museum specimens. So for every specimen in the museum, there was a data card in a file and it had the identification of the species and the locality that it was collected from and the date and other information. And my role was to look at every one of those cards and there were 28,000 mammal cards. And then I did it for uh, uh, many thousand reptiles as well um, and assign the locations for each specimen to an LCC study area. And a lot of those specimens uh, were from interstate or overseas. So uh, it wasn't really 28,000 cards that I looked at, but it was a large number. And uh, that gave me a terrific grounding in the Victorian mammal fauna, in the taxonomy of Victorian mammals, because often the names on the cards were very old and out of date, and also in Victorian geography. So I knew every vague place name across the state by the end of that work. And importantly, late in 1974, there was a seminar held at the museum given by a gentleman whose name I can't remember, but he came from the UK and he worked for the British Biological Records Centre. And they were using these newfangled things called desktop computers to record all that sort of data that I'd been laboriously pulling out and handwriting down on long lists and handing to the typists in the typing pool to type up. And so a very important seed was planted that uh, we really needed to uh, take advantage of this new technology and develop computer databases of distribution information for our flora and fauna. And when I came across to the Arthur Arthur Institute in 1976 to join the wildlife survey team, that was a major point of discussion about how we might achieve that. And I managed in by 1980, I'd managed to get funding from the Commonwealth Government, which allowed the employment of Lance Williams to begin collating data from all the different sources we could think of and putting it in a form that was suitable for computerization. And that was the start of what was originally the Victorian, the Atlas of Victorian Mammals, and subsequently grew into the Atlas of Victorian Wildlife and then the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas that we know today. And those data um, are central to all our wildlife spatial data now and the tools that we use, such as habitat distribution models and the strategic management prospects uh, tool and so on. 
Uh, also around this time, there was a continuing emphasis on waterbird and wetland studies. We'd moved on a bit from the earlier uh, focus on ducks. Uh, there were statewide surveys and categorization of wetlands led by Andrew Corrick and his wetland classification system based on water regime and salinity and vegetation structure has really stood the test of time. And those data collected in the second half of the 1970s uh, formed, the formed the basis of our current wetland spatial layer. So another critical uh, piece of work that's had a really long-term benefit. There was another timely survey that documented seabird breeding colonies across Victoria's islands and coastline. And that was undertaken by a UK ornithologist, Mike Harris, who came out here to work with Ian Norman to document for the first time our seabirds. And that uh, those data are now decades old and that survey is being repeated by the Philip Island Nature Park Research Group at the moment. The 1980s were really also a critical period for improvements to the management of duck hunting, uh, led by Ian Norman and Ron Brown, and then pulled together in a coherent policy by Richard Loyne in what I think is a seminal ARI tech report published in 1989. The changes included uh, altering the season start date to take account of molt cycles in ducks, uh, the work towards the eventual banning of lead shot, the introduction of a compulsory duck identification test for people wanting a hunting license, and the introduction of the summer waterbird count, which allowed us to make last minute management uh, modifications to particular wetlands where uh, particular values might have been identified, such as um, colonial breeding events or so on. Um, forest ecology has always been a focus at ARI, beginning in the very early days with the uh, assisting with surveys of Leadbeater's possum, just to try and work out how rare it really was and where it occurred. And that was um, assisting, collaborating with some early PhD students working on the species, uh, notably Andrew Smith and then David Lindemeyer. In the mid-1980s, zoologists from the Forest Commission uh, joined ARI, and that, that was Richard Lyon and Malcolm McFarlane, and they continued their studies on the impacts of timber harvesting and fire on forest fauna. Uh, there was a field research station established in the Mountain Ash Forest at Camberville, and studies of the ecology of yellow belly gliders and mountain brush tail possums were undertaken there, and John Seabrook worked on uh, broadtooth rats a little way down the hill. Um, also, in the late 1980s, two big projects that were being undertaken by the Forest Commission research group at Kew came across to ARI, and that is the Silver Cultural Systems Project, which was really important in improving timber harvesting prescriptions and the pre-logging surveys that were undertaken in those days uh, in logging coops prior to harvesting. And those surveys provided field experience for a large number of young ecologists, literally dozens of graduates, and many of whom are now spread across the department and in interstate departments. In 1988, the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act was passed and that led to a, another focus shift uh, more towards threatened species. And ARI played an important role in contributing to the preparation of action statements and recovery plans and implementing the research that was required under those plans as well as uh, all the usual suspects of high profile threatened species. There was also attention given to 
researching the status of a number of other species which were little known and may have been threatened, such as the peregrine falcon, the long-billed corella, um, and the squirrel glider. Through all this work, there were uh, some important advances in technology, mainly around refining methods of detecting animals. And a lot of work was done on bats in the late 1970s, micro bats, including the trialing and refining of the design of harp style bat traps. Um, <clears throat> And that work was done at IRI in, our, in the big workshop that we had then by the technician there, John Alderson. And uh, we trialled the first uh, bat traps in, used in Victoria in the Little Desert again in October 1978 when we were doing a survey of the fauna there for the Land Conservation Council. And that early um, prototype bat trap was then refined progressively over the next decade or more into a really nice design of a very portable fold up bat trap that uh, John Alderson designed. And that, that design has been sold throughout Australia and overseas now. The, the major development in our ability to, uh, to capture and identify microbats. In the late 70s, early 80s, um, the first radio tracking gear became available and was used to uh, do research on animals such as the squirrel glider and long-footed potteroo in the early days. And we even went as far as modifying a couple of land cruisers to uh, allow us to elevate the antenna up on a mast. So we drilled holes in the roof of these land, land cruisers to install a mast system that allowed us to get the antennae four or five metres above ground. And we could sit in the passenger seat of the Land Cruiser and rotate the antennae through 360 degrees and determine the direction of the animal we were interested in uh, on the compass scale that is on that circular uh, plate that you can see in the middle of the picture there. And that, that system was used on squirrel gliders up near Echuca and on long-footed potteroo studies in East Gippsland. There are also uh, quite a lot of modifications to trapping methods for mammals and reptiles, lots of modifications to the design of cage traps and trialling of pitfall traps and drift fences and hair tubes to obtain samples of hair from animals attracted into the tube by bait and an identification of that hair through microscopic examination of the, the cross sections. And uh, that right hand image there is a highly refined design of a hair tube that was developed by Dave Scotts and Steve Craig at ARI. So some conclusions about that. I think the period from 1970 to 1995 included incredible amounts of passion and energy, innovation and progress. Um, we went through that inventory phase of field surveys, which were very intensive. You know, we'd go away for two weeks at a time, uh, often camp out and then come back to the lab and process specimens and notes record our data for two weeks and then we'd go out again. So quite often, you know, for some years there, I had you know, 10 two week long field trips per year. It was pretty, pretty full on. And then that was followed by a trend towards ecological studies of particular species of interest. And that led to huge improvements in our ability to manage for those species. And then I think it's really important to note that ARI has been a training ground for very large numbers of people. S several hundred staff have passed through ARI in this period and they've emigrated to lots of different places throughout the country, uh, to the regions and head office, to consultancy companies and to interstate agencies. And finally, if you recall my 
uh, quoting of Libby Robin's uh, quote that the Little Desert campaign saw the rise of ecological consciousness in Australia. I think that we can say that ARI has continued that, made a critical contribution to continuing that rise in ecological conservationists throughout Australia and beyond. And I'll finish there with um, acknowledgements to Fern Hames, Andrew Getsky, and Kim Lowe for helping me um, organise my scattered thoughts for this presentation. Thank you. And we should be very proud of that work that was carried out in that time. Thanks. Peter, thank you so much. <laughs> Applause all around. Oh, it's a bit echoey. I might have to put my headphones in. I don't know why that's happening. While I'm doing this, Andy can check the questions. I'm just going to plug these in. Yeah, no worries. Um, Peter, Peter, I've got quite a few questions for you. The first one being, um, what has been one of your favourite projects over the years? And do you have something that might fit in your greatest accomplishment sort of section? Ah, favourite projects, they were all good. Um, I really enjoyed the surveys. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the Woodland Fauna Program was good, working on squirrel gliders and Regent honey eaters. Um, and my work with recovery teams, particularly the helmeted honey eater recovery team for about nearly 30 years, I think. And uh, yeah, the orange-bellied parrot recovery team. That one's uh, a bit of a sad story in some ways, but uh, we learnt an awful lot along the way. And uh, I think I think we can say that the orange-bellied parrot would probably have been extinct by now if we hadn't if we weren't doing what we're doing. Um, yeah. So no, I don't really have a, a particular favourite. Uh, I just like being out in the bush and having a question to address. Yeah, great. Thanks, Peter. Um, we've got another a comment, I guess, but this is around peregrine falcon and the long-billed corella, um, both having important pieces of work at ARI and being valuable later on. Do you have any comments, I guess, on those species being a, a focus study in at ARI? Um, yeah, they're both interesting ones. The peregrine falcon work started initially as an investigation in the, in the 1960s, there was a great deal of concern about DDT and its effect it accumulating in the environment and accumulating in top order predators such as the peregrine falcon. And one of the effects of DDT is um, the caused thinning of the eggshells of birds. And um, there was a great deal of concern that the peregrine falcon in particular might be seriously impacted by that. And so, I suspect from memory, I think the early work on program falcons, which was done by Bill Emerson and uh, Bill Bren, mostly, um, was around taking samples to detect levels of DDT. But then it evolved into a study of the status of program falcons, how many pairs are there in Victoria, where do they breed, and how successful is their breeding given the, the DDT issue. And, and it determined that in fact the peregrine falcon is, you know, not threatened. It's a it's rare because it's a top order predator, but it seemed to be doing pretty well. And I think that's that conclusion's been supported by the uh, more recent information. Long billed corellas were is a really interesting species. They were considered a threatened species in the 1970s. They were quite restricted in their distribution to the to the uh, red gum plains in southwest Victoria. And the increase of cropping, this cropping uh, in agricultural country moved further south. Corellas became more and more of a pest because they uh, ate the seedling wheat and grain crops. Um, so we had this conflict between a species that was pretty restricted 
and potentially declining versus um, its pest status. But since that time, uh, the long-billed corella, like, like the little corella, has expanded enormously and it's now found over a much wider area. I think the thing there is that they learnt to eat onion weed and uh, that's a very widespread weed across farmland in Victoria. And so just that change in diet allowed the species to expand enormously. So we're not too worried about it anymore. But a lot of the work again by Bill Emerson and uh, Ian Temby and Cam Bitzel was centered around did some the level of uh, financial damage that long bill corellas did to farmers. Yeah. That, that's fascinating. I actually had no idea about the long bill corellas not being as, as common as they are now. Um, thanks for that insight. Um, I've got another question about your amazing career and someone's asking what is missing? What would you like to do? Oh, <laughs> I think what's missing now in the conservation scene in Victoria is that we really need to get much better at managing land. Um, I think in a lot of cases we know what needs to be done, but we don't necessarily have the resources to do it. Um, and I think the funding, the level of funding that Parks Victoria, for example, gets is is scandalous. And you know, I spent 25 years working with a big team of other people, both within Fisheries and Wildlife, and right across the Victorian Public Service to get that huge. Uh, you know, 1300% increase in the area of conservation reserves. And now I just don't think we're managing those reserves adequately. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, another question is around, um, I guess, in a similar sense, uh, you could relate, I guess, to that funding question, but um, do you have any comments about the status of field data collection um, that we're doing at the moment? Um, they're hearing some people hear that there's, I guess, a need for more data on different species um, and a lack of opportunities to collect it. Um, they're, I guess, curious on your perspective on this. Um, well, there's certainly a need for ongoing data collection, uh, even just you know, simple distributional records are really important. I talked about the evolution of the spatial data set, and so obviously. Uh, any modelling that we do with that with those data is entirely dependent on the quality of the data that goes into it. And a lot of our data is now decades old, so we need to continue to collect distribution data because things change rapidly, like the long bill corella. Um, at least that change has been in the right direction, but nothing is static in ecology and we need to be monitoring continuously. Um, I think there's an enormous amount of good data being collected and there's new techniques for collecting it, such as the um, remotely triggered cameras and the new heat sensing uh, technology that has revolutionized the detection of small nocturnal mammals or, or will revolutionize the detection of those mammals when it becomes more widely applied. So we've got the ability to collect really good monitoring data, um, yeah, but we've just got to do it. And I think I think monitoring tends to get neglected because it's not as sexy as, um, you know, really new and uh, highly, um, <coughs> sorry, highly uh, promotable research, but uh, it's essential. Following on from that, Peter, with um, the different types of data, someone's asking about genetic work being incorporated in conservation efforts. Um, have you probably seen the rise of that, I guess, through the work you've done? Um, what role do you think that's playing and what will it play in the future? Oh, it's, it's critical. Um, and that's been just an amazing revolution in our knowledge, uh, the, the, the revolution in genetics and genetic techniques and our ability to understand population processes and partitioning amongst populations of wildlife uh, has just been astonishing and 
yeah, it's critical in the management of threatened species and in just understanding where the priorities are for any given taxon, really. And it'll it'll become more and more important over the next few decades. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff. And it's changed so much in the last couple of decades too. Um, question around uh, relating from when you were talking about natives being considered native species being considered pests. Um, can you tell us about any of the native species that were considered foods, such as the CP geese? Cape Barren geese? I, I guess so. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I'm across them. Uh, well, there, there are not many species of wildlife that in Victoria that are hunted, apart from ducks and quail. Uh, there used to be an open season for Cape Barren geese, but that was pretty short lived. And also short tailed shearwaters were harvested for a while, but I, that doesn't happen in Victoria anymore. It still does in Tasmania. Um, so most of that happened before my time, I think. Uh, I talked a bit about the refinement of the management of duck hunting. Uh, I think quail hunting needs a, uh, a lot of looking at. We really don't know. Uh, how many quail there are in Victoria? We've got no idea, and we don't probably know, don't know how many are taken during quail season either. So that's something that I think needs attention. Yep. Um, relating to, I guess, you talking about the LCC work and I guess those initial surveys you did early in your career. Um, this person's asking, what's your assessment of the current state of inventory of Victoria's fauna, including invertebrates compared to the work that was done during that period? Um, well, as I said before, I think we've switched to we've switched to uh, less intensive techniques, such as the uptake of the re remotely triggered cameras, which is great and uh, certainly gives us uh, far more efficient surveys than what the ones that I was mostly involved with were. But they they have, there's pros and cons for all of these different methods. And um, the techniques now tend to be remote, so you don't ever handle an animal. So you miss out on information about its reproductive status and things like that. Um, and also I'm a little concerned about the um, documentation of a lot of these records. Uh, we get a lot of data submitted to the VBA that is just, I took a photo of a brush-tailed fasciger gale at this point, but the, nobody gets to see the photo. You know, the photo isn't catalogued properly. Um, so I think that's a bit of a concern, and that was a concern even with the hair tube work, um, where a <coughs> An analyst would examine the hair down the microscope and say, yes, that's species X, but the hair was never actually kept and catalogued in a in a way that was retrievable. And so, you know, we're taking one person's word for it, um, which is fine if if we're confident that that person is highly competent. And most of that work was done by a woman, Barbara Triggs, who many of you will have heard of. And of course, she did fantastic work and trailblazed that whole technique. Um, but you know, there's 30 years later, we look at a record and we say, well, you know, Bob Triggs said it was a long footed potteroo, so we suppose it was. Uh, but there's no evidence remaining apart from that. And I guess it doesn't lend itself to those new techniques like genetic analysis that we now have available. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, there are ways of storing this material. You just have to want to do it enough to uh, put up the resources. Yeah, exactly. Um, a question from, I guess, an early career ecologist or student. Um, what advice would you have for someone who's looking to get involved in conservation roles after completing their studies? Yeah, this is a hard one. I get asked a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of graduates every year. There's a new cohort of graduates and there are far fewer actual jobs, but uh, there are more jobs now than there used to be. And I think 
the advice I'd give was just to um, show how, show your interest and your keenness. Um, volunteer for various roles. Um, join societies like the Field Naturalist Club or BirdLife Australia or the Australian Mammal Society and get out into the field as much as you can and get to know people and uh, yeah, just get experience from whatever way you, that you can. Thanks, Peter. Uh, sorry, I don't have a, an e there's no easy answer to that question. <laughs> you, you did a good job. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, someone's asking about the role of covenants on private land and the role of transport corridors. Um, did you have any comments or thoughts on those? Uh, yeah, I didn't mention uh, conservation on private land. Um, my focus has always been more on, on uh, getting conservation reserves, particularly large conservation reserves on and, and the only large areas of bush that remain in Victoria are on Crown land really. And uh, I think that Crown land is always going to be the basis of our flora and fauna conservation. You know, national parks and other forms of conservation reserve are essential, but of course they don't do the whole job. And there's a whole range of species of flora and fauna that uh, mostly occur on private land. And so of course they need to be conserved where their habitat is. And so the role of things like conservation covenants and the land for wildlife scheme is really important. And, uh, you know, I think Trust for Nature in Victoria do a fantastic job and it's an important job uh, to pick up those species and communities that don't occur on the Crown land that we have left in this state. And so I'd encourage all landholders to look into um, joining the Land for Wildlife Scheme or establishing a conservation covenant on their land if they've got bushland of value. Yeah. Um, I've got a question around data and this is I guess talking about the different groups that contribute data from across the state. I'm not sh sure, I think it might be the Royal Australian Ornithological, I'm not sure. R-A-O-U is the acronym yeah. for one of the bird groups, I think. And yes, it's also a mammal survey group and a V org, V O R G. So there's a couple different, I guess, groups providing data. Um, yep. What is your take, I guess, on these different sources and how do we use them? Uh, yeah, they're, they're really important. So R A O U is was the Royal Australasian Ornithologist Union. The, it's now called BirdLife Australia. It's the same organisation, um, and the RAOU in the late 1970s, early 80s conducted the Australian Bird Atlas project, which was a continent wide survey of uh, bird distributions. Uh, probably the biggest citizen science project, certainly the biggest citizen science project undertaken in Australia and one of the biggest ever in the world. Um, so yeah, their, their data is vital and that continues today through their bird data program. And I encourage all interested people to look into contributing to that. Um, the Mammal Survey Group uh, of the Field Naturalist Club of Victoria has operated for decades and used to have very close ties with ARI in the early days. And John Seebeck was um, partly the, the person who really encouraged that. And yeah, they carry out high quality surveys and the data and submit the data to the VBA. Um, VORG you mentioned that's the Victorian Ornithological Research Group uh, which has met in the ARI seminar room for decades since day one in fact um, and yeah so all of that that uh, amateur if you like um, field naturalist groups and researchers uh, play a very important role in contributing high quality data into our government data sets. Awesome, thank you Peter. Um, I knew you'd know all those acronyms. <laughs> um, Fern, we've got maybe a minute or two. I might hand it back to you for any closing points. 
Um, thanks, Peter, for answering all those questions. And thank you, everyone, who for asking them. It's been really insightful for all of us. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Peter. And, um, you know, I want to thank Peter not just for a fabulous talk, uh, taking us right through an extraordinary history that we are all proud of, but also for answering those questions. And Peter, I know you won't have had a chance to have a look at the questions or the comments, but there are a lot of people in there thanking you for a really terrific talk. And not just for the talk that you've done today, but the work that you have done over those decades and including mentoring a young ranger impacting hooded plovers on the Mornington Peninsula, where you also made a big difference. So thank you for all of the work that you've done. Thanks for this talk today. It's been really terrific. I'm sorry we, we couldn't get to all of the questions, I don't think, but um, we got to most of them. We certainly got to the sense of them and have um, heard a lot about ARI's um, efforts to make a difference in this area and the contributions that you've made. So thank you everyone. Thanks everyone for coming along. Andy put the link at the very top of the um, questions thread. There's a link to the ARI website where you can get recordings of all of the ARI legacy seminars, including this one today. It'll be up pretty soon. So thanks again. Come along next time. We're going to hear from Lindy. Continue the story on wildlife research at ARI. So tune in then. And thanks again. Thanks again, Peter. Bravo. Thank you. Bye, everybody.